on it. For the last session, we're going to move back into environmental history. We're going to start with my friend and colleague, Dr. Phil Slavin from the University of Kent, whose first book was on bread and beer. <laughs> if you can't relate to that book, then you probably shouldn't be alive. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, and Phil, Phil is the, has the honor of being the last PhD produced by John Munro, a distinguished Canadian historian of medieval economies. Um, and Phil took his training as an economic historian and transferred it to environment and consumption. So he's going to talk to us about between Sila and Sharabdis, storms, pirates, and food crises in early 14th century British waters. waters. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Steve, for this very uh, warm and, uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me to uh, go back to Ontario and enjoy several uh, wonderful days uh, uh, this year. Uh, it's been a while that I've been back here, and uh, it's always nice to be uh, home. Sorry, I, I was wondering, can you hear me without the microphone? Because I have this really irritating, irritating tendency to move back and forth. So is it okay if I, if I speak without the microphone, I get a little bit agitated when I speak. So, right, uh, I mean, I have to say, uh, my talk has, has nothing to do with this uh, magnificent project of uh, Heritage Monsoon Castle. Uh, but as an environmental historian of the same period, that is of late medieval British Isles, uh, I think my, my, my research tackles um, uh, very similar questions related to the, the dynamic uh, shifts in the late medieval environment. And uh, I'm in the process of uh, finishing my second monograph, which has nothing to do, shockingly, with neither bread or beer, <laughs> uh, but it has actually, yeah, it, it study, it's studying uh, really uh, Ill, uh, ill-famed famine of the early 14th century, which was uh, perhaps the uh, uh, worst subsistence crisis, the worst, uh, the worst food crisis in the uh, in European history in the last 2,000 years. And uh, what I want to present here is, uh, roughly speaking, a tiny little section of one chapter of my uh, book. So, uh, I mean, the whole point of uh, sharing my insights is just to show you that even as environmental historians, we always have to be careful and not uh, fall into the potential trap of uh, environmental determinism. In other words, it's always important to account for both environmental and, uh, and human or anthropogenic factors. And as a case study for today, today's presentation, I want to talk about the uh, transformation of water, or I should say transformation of the water, uh, in terms of British waters, in the early 14th century, uh, linked to a wider context of environmental change in the same period. So uh, in the early 14th century, for environmental reasons that I'll be uh, discussing in a few moments, British waters and uh, indeed any other waters in North Atlantic, in Northern Europe, uh, came in increasingly became a dangerous space. A dangerous space that was plagued not only with storms, but also with an increasing number of pirate attacks. And we, of course, all like pirates, so uh, I think it's uh, always uh, uh, nice to hear some new, fre fresh and discovered archival uh, documents here, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll mention in a few moments why there were two particular uh, peaks in pirate activity. Now, when you have this very unfortunate combination of storms and pirates, uh, you end up with very difficult socioeconomic situation because uh, all of a sudden, the bulk of grain or grain supply just disrupts. I mean, you no longer receive sufficient amounts of grain from, from one point of production to another point of consumption or distribution. Now, uh, let me just say a few words about the, the, the same great European famine of 13, 15, 13, 17. As I already mentioned, it was arguably the single harshest uh, subsistence crisis in Western history in the last 2,000 years. Its geographic spread was really remarkably vast, uh, all the way from Poland in Eastern Europe to Ireland in uh, Western Europe. Uh, it was initially caused by three back-to-back -back harvest failures. Um, there was torrential rain lasting for something like 26 months. So you can imagine uh, 26 months of really abnormally <laughs> wet weather. And uh, obviously during the winter time, the, the winter of 1315 was very, very uh, cold, So, it, which was very unusual for, for England. Uh, you had three months of snow and uh, very cold weather there. And uh, because of that, you couldn't have your grains uh, germinate, and uh, that, therefore you have three back-to-back -back harvest failures when the crop yields to the very, very uh, low levels. And um, of course, it's very tempting now for us in, as environmental historians to blame Mother Nature in creating this crisis, but 
what I want to show here is that in reality the situation must have been much more complicated than that. And it brings me really to the uh, methodological or conceptual framework related to the question, what creates famine? And actually it's one of the things I'm really trying to, hopefully, well I'm not trying to sound too arrogant I hope, but it's one of the things I'm really trying to answer in my forthcoming book, what really creates famines. And there, roughly speaking, there are two approaches, uh, uh, sorry, there's a type of it, it would really be two, not three. Uh, you have, in, on the one hand, you have, you have environmentalist approach, um, which really points the, the, the finger into Mother Nature and accuses exogenous shocks, like bad weather, uh, storms, uh, droughts, uh, flooding, uh, rain, and so on and so forth as a factors responsible for creating dearth and suffering. It was little, it, it's, to my mind, that this is a little bit deterministic, uh, as much as I'm sympathetic with this view. On the other hand, another extreme is the anthropogenic or uh, humanistic approach to uh, famine, which believes that it's really down to us humans uh, that famine is brought about. Uh, in particular through misallocation of resources. In other words, I mean, we tend to uh, take advantage of our socioeconomic and political positions in order to misallocate resources which otherwise should have been equally distributed among different uh, social strata within the same communities or within the same societies. Now, I have to say that each narrative is really, really valid, uh, equally valid, and each narrative has to be examined together. In other words, I mean, uh, two factors are really inseparable, and they have to be considered together. And uh, here what we see here, and uh, I promise you won't see, I'm an economic historian as well, as Steve uh, mentioned, but I, I promise you won't see too many of those intimidating looking graphs. What I want to show you here is that it's the second decade of the, of, of the 14th century, and uh, now you have storms, you have very stormy weather, and one thing you expect to see in high, in high seas is an increasing number of shipwrecks. And indeed what I did, I went to archives, I went through inquests, royal inquests, related to shipwrecks. And you can see this remarkable spike during the, uh, the stormy uh, and rainy years. So in other words, the average number of shipwrecks went up by something like 200, uh, sorry, some, by something like 115, 130% compared to normal years, right? And uh, here you have increase in summer precipitation levels. Uh, in other words, we know that the amount of precipitation, the, the amount of rainfall is considerably higher than normal years. On the other hand, crop yields were abysmally low. So I mean, it's really a nasty combination that not only you have lots of rain, not only that the crop yields were standing at something like 50 and 60% below average level, but also uh, the, potential, the potentially consumable grain, which was uh, shipped from one point to another point, were just lost to the sea. Okay, so in other words, I mean, this is really a uh, bad combi uh, combination of the events. So, again, it's very, te it's very tempting to blame nature through rains and storms as a, as a factor uh, aggravating famine. It was indeed a major factor, but the question that I want to ask here is whether was all ship grain lost to storms, or can we actually identify another potential a hazard related to this environmental scenario. And yes, indeed, another thing that we see around the same time is a spike in pirate activity, in piracy, in British waters. Not only in British waters, but because I'm studying British Isles, I thought I should perhaps confine my fundings to the British Isles. Now, between 1313 and 1323, there was a particularly violent phase in piracy. I mean, I'm not saying that what we see here is really unique, and uh, before the, the, second, the early 14th century there were no pirates in British seas. Of course, they always were pirates um, in Roman period, in the Anglo-Saxon period, in Anglo-Norman period, but it's very, it's, I mean, here we really enter into a unique phase in history of piracy. And uh, I think the reason is, really, is straightforward. You have violent conflict with Scotland, and the uh, Scots <coughs> didn't only master um, beaten up English as organized, very, very organized and very disciplined armies, but they also mastered beating English from the sea in their capacity of, you know, unofficial war, because piracy is, you, you can say, it's not, apart from robberies, it, it's also all about uh, unofficial fighting between uh, two countries. And uh, here just, as one example, it's one of the archival documents I've been working with, 
It's a part for, it, it's a it's a it's an excerpt. It's an entry from a household account book of the royal household. And what you see here, the the person who was responsible for, for this entry, uh, it was sheriff of two English counties in the south, the county of Surrey in Sussex. So he had to account had to account for the fact that in that year he had to pay more money in order to secure grain to be provisioned for the royal household. <coughs> so it says here, I, I, I will just translate, translate Latin into English, uh, they had to spend a certain amount of money in order to, to buy board to protect the goods, to protect the, the, the grains. And it says here in Latin, ob in, in, temp, uh, in tempere maris, because of bad weather in the sea. But in the, sense, in the next sentence, they say here that they likewise had to, expect to spend more money and uh, pay to be anchored in local ports because a propter a timorem praedonum maris, because of the fear of the, of the pirates, okay? of, the, of the robbers, of the robbers in, this, in the sea. In other words, I mean, I think this is a very nice reflection of how two factors really went uh, intimately uh, hand in hand. So, uh, I just want to say a few words about how piracy uh, can have an impact on making famine even worse than it uh, was in the beginning. Uh, famine creates, usually leads to certain socioeconomic stress when people resort to alternative and sometimes criminal method, methods of food transfers in order to either uh, sustain themselves and their households or profit from redistribution, in other words, high prices. And uh, piracy is actually one way which tends to uh, resort to, to, to both types of uh, this, it, those illicit types of uh, transfer. And uh, by the way, if we, we can think about our own day uh, examples uh, in Somalian waters during the uh, Somalian uh, Civil War, we have quite a few examples of uh, food-related famine, uh, whereby you have organized pirate vessels attacking uh, usually uh, UN uh, food uh, vessels and uh, just season um, rice and uh, barley and uh, uh, sell it on black market and sell it on, on black market for very high prices. Um, now I have to say that during the uh, the war with Scotland, uh, both English and Scots deployed piracy attacks. Now the difference was that the English pirates usually acted on their own, uh, while the Scottish pirates were, were either independent, in other words, you can, you, there, were, uh, there were a group of people belonging to the same clan, or sometimes they were paid mercenaries by the Crown of Scotland. And uh, in the case of English pirates, the, those were primarily ethnically English uh, pirates, where, uh, I mean, clo closer prosopographic analysis of Scottish sources reveals that, that quite a few of those quote unquote Scottish pirates actually came from very diverse ethnic backgrounds. Uh, there were of course lots of Scots, but they would also employ Flemish pirates, uh, Hanseatic pirates, guys from northern Germany. Uh, so we witnessed attacks, pirate, pirate attacks all over British waters uh, in the Celtic, Irish and North Sea, but there were two particular epicenters that I was able to identify that suffered especially badly from pirate attacks and this was uh, uh, the coastal uh, the coastal Kent uh, the same county where I currently hold my academic position and uh, the coast of Norfolk Lincolnshire that's the eastern part of England uh, and I think the reason is quite straightforward because both Kent and uh, those two eastern counties provide if you wish a window to England from the continent so in other words it would be very easy for continental guys to reach English coast and uh, the first place, the first uh, place that it would uh, stop or anchor would be either Kent or Norfolk. So it would lots of, make lots of sense for them to attack those places. Uh, there were two major tactics that would either they would either intercept and plunder and sometimes destroy merchant ships, so they knew exactly uh, what ships to target, or alternatively they would anchor very briefly, uh, plunder local coastal communities, uh, raid. You know, plunder their barns and granaries, take away as much wheat, as much food as possible, run back to the ships and uh, just uh, carry on uh, to the next community. So by doing that, they basically would kill two birds with one shot. Uh, 
they would A, weaken local communities, and B, they would supply their own side with food supplies during the, those very difficult times. Because we have to remember that the Great Famine wasn't only confined to England, it was also a very serious issue in Scotland, in the Low Countries, in Germany. In other words, I mean, I'm sure that those parts were is very, very popular and much, much loved in their own countries. Uh, so I just want to go back to the same graph that I showed you before, but the only exception here, that, that apart from shipwrecks, you see the same tendency for pirate attacks. And the difference between shipwrecks and the pirate attacks, that pirate attacks actually carried on on quite substantial level after the end of the Great Famine. In other words, maybe the Great Famine was over after the, the, after the weather returned to normal in 1317, <coughs> but as long as the war was there, pirate attacks were still at the very highest. So that's one thing we have to account for. Actually, I think I have a little bit more, more slides than I expected to show here. So uh, do I have about 10 more minutes or f five minutes? Yeah. Uh, one thing we can actually spot or analyze in, in the sources are ethnic background of different mariners or the pirates who were involved in uh, English uh, grain trade piracy. Uh, the majority of them actually came from the Low Countries, from Flanders, uh, which is hardly surprising for two reasons. First of all, uh, uh, Flanders at, at that time had arguably the single most developed uh, commercial fleet, and in many cases, uh, great merchants were also pirated at the same time, so it's really hard to distinguish between the two groups sometimes. But the second reason is purely political. Uh, Count Robert III wasn't the greatest friend of Edward II, and uh, at, at the same time, he actually, uh, he sided with the King of France, and uh, it had this, you know, deal that if they could, you know, if they could agree to attack as many ships as possible, they, the, 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 uh, the, the Flemish merchants would be able to trade the raw grain on French markets without tariffs. So I think it was very beneficial for both sides. So this one thing to account for. But uh, the second largest group uh, was made up of English pirates, and actually English pirates, apart from attacking Scottish. Uh, or Irish coast, they would sometimes also attack their own communities. Uh, you also have uh, Scottish, uh, Irish, French, Breton, but these were really marginal groups compared to uh, those three groups, uh, Scots, English, and Flemings. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned this fact, so I'm gonna skip that. Uh, I want to, before I wrap up, I just want to present you three portraits or three brief biographies of uh, pirates that I was able to identify based on the archival work that I've done. So the, the English pirates could boast their leader called John, John Crabbe, who wasn't really, by the way, English because he was born in Flanders, but he changed side at some point and became naturalized citizen or naturalized subject of Edward II for uh, his remarkable service as, as a pirate. So I think, you know, one way, you know, if you're looking for fast track to get British citizenship, you can always become pirate and, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, don't, don't quote me, I know I'm getting recorded, so I'm careful that because uh, I'm in the process of applying for British citizenship. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, uh, he was leader of uh, uh, Flemish merchants and uh, he was first hired by Scots. Um, I was based at Aberdeen, where he conducted attacks into English waters. He usually targeted valuables, food and wine, so he made, made himself this name of being a very, very just pirate. Uh, he was popular in both Scotland and Flanders. Then, finally, he was caught by Edward III in 1333, and uh, he was tortured almost to death. Uh, he had, I believe, to uh, give up his Scottish allegiance, and they had to, uh, because you know, otherwise he would, be, he would get killed. So the only way for him to save his life was to swear allegiance to Edward III and became his subject. So he indeed became very faithful royal servant of Edward III, and he remained in this capacity up until his death in 1352. So as you can say, lots of those guys were people totally without principles, without any um, political attachment, if you want. Um, this guy was Scottish, Thomas Dunn, as you can hear in his last name, it's a very typical Scottish last name. He was a Scottish counterpart of John Crabbe. Uh, he threw much terror in the Irish Sea, attacking primarily English vessels, because between 1315 and 1317 you had this uh, Scottish and English interference, intervention in Ireland. So this guy, Thomas Dunn, used this opportunity to attack as many English uh, commercial vessels as possible. Sometimes, by the way, he didn't mind collaborating with 
Welsh, and uh, as you know, Welsh born were very would be quite happy to ally with anyone against English around the same time. Again, I feel bad about getting recorded about that. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's a post-Brexit scenario. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, well, but I, I didn't vote Brexit, so I'm quite proud of that. So now, one thing which, which I can uh, I, should, I, I should perhaps mention about him that. Country to uh, the previous guy, somehow he managed to attack so many ships within the space of two and a half years between early 1315 and uh, spring 1317. That by the time he was arrested, a really enormous piles of grain, enormous enormous piles of money and cash and hard specie were found in his headquarters. Obviously, it was handed over to Edward II, and I'm sure Edward II, King of England, was very happy because that was exactly he needed around the same time. Uh, so Edward II, when uh, he had to gather a really large crew in order to uh, attack uh, Thomas Dunn and uh, his friends, so he uh, mobilized a huge crew of 140 men. He finally was captured, uh, not before he managed to, I think, knock down several people fighting. <coughs> in July 13, 17, Dunn and his men were captured with much resistance and executed, as expected. Uh, now, I'm not trying to say that the English were angels and uh, didn't, in, weren't engaged in what I call counter-piracy. Counter-piracy, well, why do I call counter-piracy? Well, because it came as a response, or allegedly as a response, but I'm sure that uh, we have English piracy even without uh, other, trouble, uh, other troublemakers in the sea. So, in summer 1314, so in the very beginning of this high period of piracy in British seas, mariners of Winchelsea, uh, which is, by the way, it's a town in Sussex, so finally I have some relation to <laughs> Sussex. Petitioned uh, King Edward II for a license to patrol, quote unquote, patrol the North Sea coast. In other words, to defend North Coast Sea, in order to counter foreign pirates. So very soon, it wasn't before too long, when patrol became piracy. And between 1314 and 1321, you have lots of references to numerous attacks of uh, English vessels attacking both foreign and other English vessels. Uh, the vast majority of pirates came from the uh, same ports, that's another confederacy of Kentish and Sussex commercial towns, so if you want, it's, it's the English version of the Hans Hanseatic League. Uh, but also from, uh, from Norfolk, and especially Great Yarmouth. What's interesting about Great Yarmouth, that Great Yarmouth itself had very strong commercial ties with Hanseatic League. It was in fact one of the Hans Hanseatic headquarters in England. So, in other words, I mean, it's a coincidence. So, we have a very strong connection between commerce, between international trade and piracy. So, in, in some instances, uh, we're talking about the same people who were, who were both international traders and pirates. And uh, English could also boast their own Thomas Dunn or, or their own John Crabbe. This guy was called John Kitty, who was executed in 1321. He was from the glorious town of Winchelsea. Uh, his gang used to terrorize English waters for something like seven years, from 1314 until 1321. Uh, indiscriminately, they were targeting all sorts of commercial vessels. So you know, if you, I mean, you can really, you couldn't possibly ask for any more victims of those guys. I mean, they were attacking anyone: English vessels, Scottish vessels, German vessels, Flemish vessels, French vessels. They were really. Uh, Jumped and enjoy by seeing a new vessel uh, approaching there. They were uh, their ep the epicenter of their attacks was uh, focused around Suffolk, Norfolk, and Lincolnshire. Uh, it took something like a year to, uh, for the Royal Navy to manage to catch them. He was caught, tried, and he ha was hanged as a traitor in 1321. Now, what's really important to understand here is that. We can't really understand what was going on with this guy unless we go into the political context. There was civil war going on in England between Edward II and the and the the, the baron and his barons, uh, so-called contrarians, led by Thomas of Lancaster, who was the second most powerful figure in England after the king. Now, it's quite possible that the, the barons, led by Thomas of Lancaster, used John Kitty as a tool in order to weaken the royal forces, royal naval forces around the same time. Uh, I will skip 
uh, local encounters with, with the pirates, but I just want to just uh, briefly mention here that another, apart from state papers, I also delve into local archives, uh, into court roles, and uh, in particular did some work with court roles related to coastal communities, and uh, we have really interesting uh, entries into local court roles when um, local granaries and local barns were plundered by those pirates. But in some cases, like here, it's a 1317 uh, entry, uh, entry to court roll uh, from Curtin and Lindsay, that's in Lincolnshire. It's a coastal community uh, in central part of Lincolnshire, where we have reference to apprehension of those pirates. Uh, they talk about certain unknown people here, uh, Ignoti, uh, who came by through the water per aqua, and uh, they tried to steal corn or grain on the sheaf, and uh, they were caught, they were beaten up by local communities, they were apprehended, uh, they were uh, placed in local barn and waited to be ransomed. Once finally the ransom was paid, that's very important, they were let go, but the anchor was kept by the local community as a symbol of the defeat of those pirates <laughs> because it basically you know, made them uh, totally you know, and incapable of attacking or anchoring again. Uh, okay, just one last thing before I wrap up. What was the impact of piracy on famine? It's really difficult to quantify because different quantities of food uh, were seized every time. Uh, the quantities would vary from uh, something like several hundreds of pounds to tens of thousands of pounds. I mean, I give the figures in quarters. Uh, each quarter stands for something like, some like 424 pounds. So we're talking about sometimes really huge sums of grain. Uh, now, uh, there are lots of reports, but at the same time, the pro the most likely there were much more unreported cases. In other words, it's really, important, it's really impossible really to quantify the full extent of piracy attacks on food crisis in the early 14th century. So definitely, it did have some very strong impact on food availability, especially as far as coastal communities are concerned. And uh, theoretically speaking, it, I think in Greece very nicely with what Amartya said, one of the, one of the greatest uh, theorists of uh, famine studies said that uh, it, famine is not only created by natural factors, but uh, institutional factors are very paramount uh, aspects in intensifying the, the gravity, the, the harshness of famine. So, uh, I just want to really conclude quite, uh, very quickly and uh, um, just uh, finally shut up. Uh, so, what can we learn from that? Well, first of all, there was very serious spike, which can be quantified, as I hope to have shown in the beginning, in piracy attacks between 1313 and 1323. And it should be really interpreted here as a natural manifestation of unfortunate combination of famine and warfare. In other words, you can't possibly wish any worse combination than having famine and war at the same time. And unfortunately, as history has, has taught us, in many instances, famines and war and warfare, armed conflict, go together at the same time. And uh, of course, what we see in some countries in Eastern, Eastern Africa today is a very good example of that. There's no clear-cut distinction between so-called bad foreigners and good locals because in many cases English pirates attacked English, uh, English targets uh, while, as a, for example, Flemish mercenaries uh, would easily change sides depending who would be ready to pay more. And again, we can see, we can spot similar situation in some African conflicts today when uh, some pirates um, also end up uh, unloading their... Uh, their, their uh, merchandise and their trade to local communities. Uh, so there's no clear cut distinction between pirates and merchants in this uh, uh, very sad context of famine. So when taken together with storms, piracy um, certainly disrupted food transportation and supply and contributed further to the effects and impact of the great European famine of the early 14th century and uh, it really strengthens uh, the uh, the notion that we cannot really appreciate famine only through one factor. Uh, we really have to account for both exogenous or natural on the one hand and endogenous or uh, human or anthropogenic factors at the same time in order to appreciate that. And I really hope that the, uh, the example of what happened to the British waters in the early 14th century uh, just partially shed some light onto that as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>